Welcome to lecture 16 of Electrical Engineering 525. In this lecture, we'll move on into chapter 8, which is about arrays. And uh, so let's jump right into a problem uh, representative of the kind of material that we want to discuss at the beginning here. Uh, this problem is 8.3-7b, and uh, for the test 16, you will be asked to do problem 8.3-7a, which is very similar to this, so pay careful attention. What we want to do in this problem is to design a five-element, uniformly excited, equally spaced linear array uh, with a main beam maximum at 45 degrees from broadside. So theta naught is equal to 45 degrees in this case. Uh, we're also asked to select the element spacing uh, and linear phasing such that the beam width is as small as possible and also so that no part of a grating lobe appears in the visible region. So uh, when we're going to do problems of this type, where we want to start is with equation uh, 822 uh, for the pattern in terms of C. And this uh, the equation is uh, that f of C is equal to sine of n C over 2 divided by n sine C over 2. And here n is the number of elements, so in the present problem n is equal to 5. C is equal to beta d plus, uh, oh, excuse me, beta d cosine theta plus alpha, uh, and alpha is equal to uh, minus beta d cosine theta naught, where theta naught is the um, angle <coughs> uh, where, uh, for the main beam maximum. So in this case, uh, as is noted here in the statement of the problem, theta naught is equal to 45 degrees. Note one thing here about theta naught. Theta, uh, the fact that um, the main beam maximum is 45 degrees from broadside, uh, that that could be misunderstood. The angle from broadside is not, in general, going to be the value of theta naught. Remember that broadside, it, well, in this case, theta naught, or let's say theta, is measured. Uh, as the angle from the positive z-axis. Now broadside is 90 degrees from uh, the z-axis. So if we wanted um, this uh, main beam to be in the broadside direction, in other words at zero degrees from broadside, or uh, you know in exactly the broadside direction, then theta naught would be 90 degrees. So <laughs> The fact that both of these uh, are, are 45 degrees, does, that could be misinterpreted, uh, but don't make that mistake. Don't think that theta naught is the amount of deviation from broadside. No, it's not. Theta naught is the amount of deviation from the positive z direction, but in this case, the amount, uh, since, since broadside is at 90 degrees, then uh, theta naught being at 45 degrees happens to also be 45 degrees away from broadside which is at 90 degrees so just make sure that you realize that theta naught is measured from the positive z direction it is not measured from broadside okay so now proceeding with this problem we have written down uh, this uh, formula for the pattern in terms of c and uh, the problem here is that we, we want to find out, we are given theta naught, but we would like to find out uh, D. We want this uh, element spacing D. And we also, um, once we have D, 
then that will give us alpha. Alpha and D uh, are both uh, in this equation. So we, we know theta naught, but we don't know either alpha or D. If we could find out either one of those, then we could determine the other and we would have the solution to the problem because that's, that's really what this problem amounts to is just finding alpha and D. But uh, we're given some criteria for helping us to determine alpha and D and those criteria are that we select the element spacing and linear phasing such that the beam width is as small as possible and also so that no part of a grading lobe appears in the visible region. Now, uh, briefly, um, the part that says to uh, choose these so that the beam width is as small as possible, that much that just means to pick D as large as possible while also satisfying the other uh, criteria given in the problem. So we're going to pick D as large as possible. That's what the, the first part means. But at the same time, we want to pick D in such a way that no part of a grading lobe appears in the visible region. So what is a grading lobe? Well, we can understand that uh, in, by following this step one here, which says to draw a graph of the magnitude of f of c versus c, showing the uh, first grading lobes to the left and right of the main lobe at c equals zero. Now, how uh, is the easiest way for us to draw this graph, keeping in mind that f of c is given right here? Well, the first thing that we can note is that when c uh, is equal to zero, we have uh, a, a form sine of zero over n sine of zero, and of course the sine of zero is zero, so we have a form here for f of 0 over 0. So this is one of those cases where we would use L'Hopital's rule. Likewise, when c over 2 is equal to minus pi or pi, we would have the same situation because if, uh, if uh, for instance, if c over 2 were equal to minus pi, then this would be the sine of minus n pi in the numerator, which would clearly be 0, and the sine of minus pi in the bottom, which would be 0. Or if c over 2 were positive pi, then uh, in the top we would have the sine of n pi, which is 0, and in the bottom we'd have the sine of pi, which is 0. So in each one of these cases, uh, if c over 2 is equal to minus pi or 0 or pi, now there would be other angles as well, but these are the three that we're uh, interested in. Uh, these are the only three we need to consider. So if we look at these three values for c over 2, in each one of those cases, uh, the f function has a form of 0 over 0, and so we use L'Hopital's rule. And L'Hopital's rule says that the value at uh, under, such under such circumstances is simply equal to the limit as C uh, approaches that critical point of the derivative of the numerator divided by the derivative of the denominator. Well, if the numerator, since the numerator is sine of n C over 2, the uh, derivative of that will be n over 2 cosine of n c over 2. And uh, similarly in the bottom, when we take the derivative with respect to c, we get n times 1 half cosine of c over 2, which is the same thing that we have in the top. So uh, <coughs> when we take the limit of this, um, as C approaches any one of these three angles, um, or three values, let's say, uh, we just have one. Now, notice here one other thing that I want to make sure doesn't confuse you. We're looking at the situations when C over 2 is equal to minus pi, 0, or pi. So that's when C is equal to minus 2 pi, 0, or 2 pi. And uh, that's noted here in this expression for L'Hopital's rule. So the three 
uh, values of C that we're interested in there are 0, minus 2 pi, and 2 pi. So we conclude then, as we said above, that f of negative 2 pi is equal to f of 0 is equal to f of 2 pi, and that's equal to 1. Now, the lobes that are peaking at c equals minus 2 pi and c equals 2 pi are called grading lobes. And these are the ones that we want to entirely avoid. We want to make sure that no part of the grading lobe is in the visible region. And that's written here. It says, recall that in this problem, we are to choose the element spacing and the linear phasing so that no part of these grading lobes appears in the visible region. Okay, now writing down again uh, our expression for f of c right here, uh, we can also note that not only um, can we get information about where f of c is equal to 1, uh, and again that's at uh, c equals minus 2 pi, 0, and 2 pi, but we can also get some information about where f will go to 0, and that will be when this argument of the uh, sine function in the numerator is equal to plus or minus pi, plus or minus 2 pi, plus or minus 3 pi, and plus or minus 4 pi. Now, we don't want to go to the uh, plus or minus 5 pi because notice that if we went to plus or minus 5 pi, if we had n c over 2 is equal to plus or minus 5 pi, we'll remember that in this case n is equal to 5, so if n c over 2 were equal to plus or minus 5 pi, that would mean that c over 2 is equal to plus or minus pi, and that is uh, one of the cases we considered up here. So we don't want to go as far as uh, n c over 2 equals plus or minus um, n pi, let's say, which in this case would be 5 pi, but we do want to consider those um, that are greater than 0 pi but less than uh, in plus or minus n pi. So we get plus or minus 1 pi, plus or minus 2 pi, plus or minus 3 pi, plus or minus 4 pi. So we've gone all the way, you might say, from plus or minus 1 pi to plus or minus n minus 1 pi. And that's what you'll always want to do. Depending on whatever n is, uh, they, the zeros will occur at plus or minus uh, 1 pi, plus or minus 2 pi, dot, 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 up to plus or minus n minus 1 pi. Okay, and now um, dividing uh, both sides of this by n, then, where, of course, remember again, n is equal to 5, and um, actually, uh, let's also multiply both sides by 2 so that we just are left with C on the left-hand side. And we will then conclude that, uh, and, and just to make this a little more explicit, I'll change what's written here. Um, okay, let's, let's change this, and we'll say add c equals okay so again in in going from this line right here uh, to this line we've simply uh, multiplied both sides by 2 over n so we get c equals plus or minus 2 pi over 5 plus or minus 4 pi over 5 plus or minus 6 pi over 5 and plus or minus 8 pi over 5 so taking this into account we are now finally ready to graph f of c, the magnitude of f of c, for c between minus 2 pi and 2 pi, and this is what it looks like. Now notice, as we've already said, when c is equal to minus 2 pi, or 0, or 2 pi, uh, f is equal to 1. So these are the three points at which the graph reaches its maximum value. Now, this lobe over here is a, uh, we're going to refer to that as the left grading lobe. This one over here is the right grading lobe, and this is the main lobe. 
and notice also that we have zeros as predicted at minus two minus plus or minus two pi over five plus or minus four pi over five plus or minus six pi over five and plus or minus eight pi over five now recall also that we were told that we want to choose uh, D uh, we want to choose the separation D and the phasing alpha so that no part of these grading lobes either one of these grading lobes either the left grading lobe or the right grading lobe appears in the visible region so that means that the uh, we will uh, be willing to consider a visible region anywhere between these two dotted lines here at C equals minus 8 pi over 5 and C equals 8 pi over 5 but no more than that so now that we've drawn this graph uh, we're ready to finish this problem uh, with step 2 and, and, and step 2 says that if alpha is negative determine alpha plus beta D by uh, excuse me determine alpha and this is an and determine alpha and beta d by using the equation alpha minus beta d equals the right edge of the left grading lobe and on the other hand if alpha is positive use alpha pl plus beta d equals the left edge of the right grading lobe now where is that coming from well it, it goes like this and I'm sure I'm not going to be able to draw this perfectly but hopefully you'll get the um, the idea okay so if we were going to draw the polar plot uh, for this uh, pattern what we would want to do as is shown here in this figure remember that we want to avoid we want to entirely avoid the left grading lobe and the right grading lobe so we begin by drawing these vertical lines this one is drawn at the left edge of the right grading lobe and this one is drawn at the right edge of the left grading lobe and here I have also drawn a vertical line at zero now we um, we want to place the center of our pole uh, of our polar plot at alpha and in this case alpha is negative remember alpha is equal to minus beta d cosine theta naught here it is right here alpha is minus beta d cosine theta naught and in the present problem theta naught is 45 degrees so this will be a negative number so that's why here in this figure we've shown alpha uh, to be uh, to the left of zero we don't know exactly how far so just for the sake of illustration I'm putting it here now now once we have determined that then this problem is almost over okay so now what this means is that the um, the main restriction for the polar plot is going to come from this uh, this vertical line right here which is the the right edge of the left grading lobe if on the other hand if alpha were over here to the right the main restriction for the polar plot would be coming in from the left edge of the right grading lobe now what do I mean by this main restriction well I mean the following the polar plot will have this point right here at alpha it will have that as the center of the polar plot and then we will extend the polar plot in this case since we're to the uh, to the left of zero we're going to come over here to the left grading lobe and we start drawing a circle the, now the circle again is centered uh, here at this point and we can go over as far as this uh, right edge of the great of the left grading lobe but no farther and so then we uh, finish the circle like this and again of course this is not going to be perfect but just to 
give you a general idea. And so there is our uh, circle and we uh, will choose uh, D so that this distance right here, the radius of the circle is equal to beta D. Now remember, this is at alpha, and, and if you wish, we could say minus beta D here. I, mean, I, I, I really don't want to do that because beta D is actually this distance. Beta D is the radius, but we're going beta D in the negative direction. So that's uh, alpha minus beta. This is alpha minus beta D here. Alpha, alpha minus beta D. And on the other hand, uh, this point here would be alpha plus beta D. Now, uh, once again, if alpha, if this center, which is at alpha, if it were to the right of the center, then the main restriction being placed on this polar plot would be on this edge. We would want this edge to go no further over than to this point. And so then our restriction would be uh, alpha plus beta D is equal to uh, 8 pi over 5. But in this case, the restriction that we want to deal with is alpha minus beta D is minus 8 pi over 5. So that's how we're uh, getting this uh, restriction right here. We say if alpha is negative, determine alpha and beta d by using the equation alpha minus beta d is the right is equal to the right edge of the left grading lobe and in this case the right edge of the left grading lobe is at minus 8 pi over 5 so we're going to set alpha minus beta d equals minus 8 pi over 5 but on the other hand if alpha had been positive so that the circle was over here in this region then uh, our restriction would be, it says if alpha is positive, use alpha plus beta D is equal to the left edge. Here's the left edge of the right grading lobe. And so in that case, we would have said alpha plus beta D is equal to positive 8 pi over 5. And by the way, the way that we would now finish the uh, plot would be we could come down here. Once we have the outline of the circle for the polar plot, then we could come down here and, for instance, we pick off the um, the uh, the maximum the maxima from the plot above, and it would look like this. So, okay, here this is where the main beam maximum. You can see this is the one from our plot above. It comes down to right here, and so this would be our main lobe right here and notice that sure enough this looks like it is at about 45 degrees which is what we um, this is what we were designing for now for the next maximum uh, here at this angle Come, you know, notice we've come down here to this point. Now, it's not going to come out as far because this value is not as large as this. This is at 1, and this looks like it, it's roughly at 1 half. Then the next one would be over here at this um, location. And so we would have something like... Um, like that. And then we could even have uh, uh, one more down here. Now that one's uh, a bit harder to line up, but but the the idea here that the the main beam max the main beam is easy because we just look at where this main beam intersects with uh, the circle, and that gives us the direction which again in this case should be, it should be 45 degrees and it looks like it is indeed 45 degrees. Okay, let me change one thing I've said here. Um, 
the what I've shown you here is not the easiest way to find uh, beams other than the main beam. The main beam is indeed it's best as we have said to um, just look at the main beam from the graph above and then extend it below but as we could see as, as, I, was sh as I was saying it, it, it becomes more difficult to do that for the other for the non main beams and so um, I'll show you what to do in those cases so again we have the main beam here at one so we can drop this down where th where that hits the uh, your s your outer circle for your polar plot that will be your main beam but see the problem is we were encountering the problem with the other beams is that they do not have a magnitude of one so they won't stretch all the way to the edge of the circle. They'll be just intermediate and so it's hard to judge at which angle to put those. Instead what you want to do is af after the uh, main beam, after dropping the vertical line for the main beam, then drop vertical lines not for these other beams but for the zeros. So if we drop a vertical line for that zero and a vertical line for this zero and a vertical line for this zero, then that means that, uh, and, and then once we see where those lines hit the circle, we can draw, uh, actually this should be dot, dotted, so let's have a dotted line here, and a dotted line here, and one here, and then of course we have one over here and now uh, we'll have our other beams between those and uh, how far out we go for each of those is determined by the beam above but as we said before if you deal with the the beam peak uh, for these intermediate beams, the ones that, that have a uh, magnitude less than one, it's hard to judge where to put those. But if you'll, if you'll only deal with the, mean, the beam peak for this main beam and for all the other beams, it, instead of dealing with the peak, you deal with the zeros, then you can find exactly where those beams should be. And so we get this uh, for the uh, pattern right here. This this polar plot down here. This is the pattern for uh, this array. And notice that it has um, four uh, lobes in it. And this is for a beam with five elements. And this is a general rule that the number of lobes will be n minus one, where n is the number of elements. So that's how uh, we get the polar pattern and uh, furthermore the way that we've constructed that helps us to understand these two restrictions that if when alpha is negative we want to set alpha minus beta d equal to the right edge of the left graining lobe and when alpha is uh, positive we want to set alpha plus beta d equal to the left edge of the right graining lobe so in the present case then since alpha is negative uh, we set alpha minus beta d equal to the right edge of the left grading lobe, which in this case is equal to minus 8 pi over 5. Now, that's not always going to be the case. It depends on n. But in this case, since n is equal to 5, we get uh, minus 8 pi over 5. Alpha minus beta d is minus 8 pi over 5. Now, uh, remember that alpha is equal to minus beta d cosine theta naught, and we know theta naught is 45 degrees. So we get minus beta d cosine of 45 degrees. Minus beta d is minus 8 pi over 5, or minus beta d times square root of 2 over 2. Minus beta d is equal to minus 8 pi over 5. Uh, multiply through by negative sign. Factor out beta d on the left, and you get beta d times 1 plus the square root of 2 over 2 is equal to 8 pi over 5. And uh, then recall that beta is 2 pi over lambda. 
and um, and so the pi from the two pi over lambda will cancel with the pi on the right hand side the two of the two pi will cancel with this two uh, multiply both sides by lambda uh, divide both sides by two uh, plus the square root of two and we get d is equal to lambda times eight over this five right here five times two plus the square root of two so this is 0 0.4686 lambda so d is 0 0.469 rounding off d is 0 0.469 lambda and then when we stick that into the equation for alpha remember alpha is um, minus beta d cosine 45 degrees so that's minus 2 pi over lambda for beta and 0 0.469 lambda for d and square root of 2 over 2 for the cosine of 45 degrees and we get alpha is equal to minus 0 0.663 pi so that is the uh, linear alpha is what they were calling up here the linear phasing d is the element spacing and uh, alpha is the linear phasing and now we have selected both of those uh, so that we have the beam width as small as possible with the again where that came in was picking the largest d so that we went here right to the to the edge of the grading lobe but we didn't go uh, we didn't extend into the grading lobe at all so uh, that satisfies our two criteria here that we um, want to have the beam width as small as possible first but we also want no part of a grading lobe to appear in the visible region so we've accomplished both of those goals by extending this all the way over to this point but no further than that so uh, that concludes our first problem in the design of uh, equally spaced again recall e this is an equally spaced linear array that's uh, uniformly excited and we will look at uh, in future problems we'll look at some more of those but again for your test uh, you'll be dealing with the first part of this problem 8.3-7a so that concludes uh, lecture 16 and uh, good luck